that you have come to us and Jesus the Christ, Emmanuel, and Lord Jesus, we thank you that you said wherever two or three are gathered in your name that you are there in that place with them and we want you to be here. Lord God, I, I would like it if you would preach the sermon this morning because uh, Father, it's on Ephesians chapter three and there's some strange, wild stuff in there. And uh, Lord, you are strange and wild, and I know you want to make us strange and wild. You want to make us holy. Uh, so Father, I, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would open our hearts and you would help us to believe the wonders of your grace and that you would guard the words that come out of my mouth so that if any of them aren't of you, nobody in this place would remember them, that they just drop into oblivion. But Lord God, whatever is of you, would you pierce our hearts? Would you change us? Would you make us like yourself? Would you help us now, Lord God, to preach? In Jesus' name, amen. I love that clip. And uh, I've actually used it in the past for years to kind of describe the Christian life and our uh, Christian walk because you see, just like Indiana Jones, we battle against principalities and powers of evil. And we get so stressed and so anxious and wonder what we're gonna do and God has given us weapons and he wants us to wield those weapons. He's given us armor and he's given us uh, weapons. Ephesians 1.19, Paul prays that we would know the immeasurable greatness of God's power in us who believe. Since we're preaching through Ephesians, I really hope that you would spend some time reading Ephesians. Uh, on your own. I also hope that you would spend some time reading Acts chapter 19 and 20. In Acts 19 and 20, Luke recounts Paul's ministry in Ephesus. You know, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he baptized the Ephesians believers in the Holy Spirit. And then he taught for three months in the synagogue, and when that went rather sour, he went and taught two years in the hall of Tyrannus, such that Acts 19.10, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jew and Greek, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away um, to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Verse 19, a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Um, their value was estimated at 50,000 pieces of silver. Now a piece of silver, a drachma in that day, was roughly what a person would, would earn for a day's salary. I mean, so we're talking like millions of dollars here, okay? Uh, this really must have had an effect on the Ephesian economy. In fact, a silversmith in Ephesus named Demetrius, uh, next in Acts, leads an uprising against Paul because Paul is wrecking the economy of Ephesus. Ephesus was the site of the temple of Artemis. Artemis was like the Asian uh, mother goddess. And because so many people had turned to Jesus, they no longer bought the silver shrines uh, to Artemis made by the silversmith Demetrius. Well, I'm just saying that Paul had armor and he had weapons of immense power. In fact, next, in Acts chapter 21, he raises a dead guy named, named Eutychus. Paul preached so long that Eutychus fell asleep and fell out of the window dead. Basically, Paul killed him with his preaching. <laughs> and then he raised him from the dead by the power of God. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's good preaching. Anyway, it's easy to argue that outside of Jesus, Paul had the most successful ministry in all of history. Paul lived the successful Christian life, the victorious Christian life. Well, probably sometime around 61 or 62 AD, about six years after his time in Ephesus, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. This week, we pick up the letter at Ephesians chapter three, verse one. For this reason, 
Now, now that would be that God will anakephalio, unite all things in, in him, break down the dividing walls of hostility, the stuff we've been preaching on uh, for, 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 for nine weeks. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner. Did you catch that? A prisoner. Paul, who lives such a victorious, successful, powerful Christian life, Paul, who raised the dead, miraculously was just delivered a little while before from the Philippian prison by, by an earthquake. Paul, who was the very first dude in all of history to do the miracle prayer claw thing, right? Well, he's not staying at the Ramada Inn with the heated swimming pool. He's in prison. He's in prison in Rome for violating the dividing wall in the temple in Jerusalem, separating Jews from Gentiles. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you, you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace. Now, that is a wild stewardship. He's a steward in charge of handing his master's stuff out for free. The stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written, by revelation, literally by apocalypsis. That means an unveiling. Paul had a revelation. And in chapter one, remember, he prayed that the Ephesians would also have a revelation. And in 20 or 30 years after Paul has died, John the Apostle would send a book to Ephesus from the prison island of Patmos entitled The Revelation of Jesus. Not titled The Revelation of Freaky Weird Stuff That Goes Down in 2013, but The Revelation of Jesus. It reveals Jesus. And it reveals principalities and powers. Like the beast from the land. And the beast from the sea. And the great harlot that rides the beast. All under the dominion of Satan, the dragon. It reveals how they all are conquered by a lamb. Who is also a word that rides a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. A logos, a word. He conquers, and those with him conquer all things. Verse four. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed or, or uncovered to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. The Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Well, for a Jew, the Gentiles are the others. The others on the other side of the dividing wall of hostility. The Gentiles were the not chosen. They were the people that were not chosen by God as his own precious possession. Uh, they were the people that had not been chosen by God to, to, to save and bring into the promised land. For you see, God promised to save Israel and bring Israel into the promised land. Ezekiel 37, 12, even the dry bones. Even the dry bones he would raise from the valley of dry bones and bring them into the land. And, and now Paul writes, this is the mystery hidden for ages. Chosen people, I'm talking to you chosen people. Chosen people, the unchosen people are now your heirs or, or your fellow heirs, your brothers and, 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 and your sisters. Isaac, father of Israel, Ishmael, father of the Arabs, is your fellow heir, your brother. Judah, the lost tribes, the Samaritans, they are your fellow heirs. Jacob, Esau, is your brother and fellow heir. The people on the other side of the wall are your family. And that family is your inheritance, the kingdom of God, your mutual father. And now something truly astounding happens in Ephesians. Something that I believe has been largely hidden from the institutional church ever since she became 
uh, a servant of the principalities and powers of Rome around 600 AD. Paul begins to refer to the Gentile believers as chosen and those that don't believe in Christ as the Gentiles. Chapter 417, writing to the, the Greeks, that is, the Gentiles in the flesh, Paul writes this, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, you Gentiles in the flesh. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, darkened in, in their minds, alienated from the life of God. Do you see, for Paul, the Gentiles are now the children of wrath, the unbelievers, the unsaved, the people on the other side of the quote-unquote evangelical dividing wall of hostility, the people destined for the valley of dry bones or, or already there. Now listen to the verse again. This mystery is that the Gentiles, he didn't say some Gentiles, he said the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This mystery is that the unchosen are now chosen in Christ Jesus. This mystery is that the unbelievers are our fellow heirs in Christ Jesus. This mystery is that the unchosen are somehow or will be chosen. The people that were not my people are my people. And yet we know, we know this, that, that apart from faith in Christ Jesus, none can enter the kingdom of God. And many die without confessing faith in Christ Jesus. So, so how can this be? Well, I can't explain all of God's judgments, but in the next chapter, Ephesians 4, Paul tells us that Jesus descends into the depths of the earth and leads a host of captives free. In Corinthians, he talks about baptizing people on behalf of the dead. Peter writes, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey in the days of Noah. And then he goes on, 1 Peter 4, 6, the gospel was proclaimed even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And Jesus said something truly astounding, and I don't know how we, we, we miss it, but, but I, th I think it was at Caesarea Philippi, we went to the spot when we were in Israel, he said to his disciples, I'm telling you, the gates of Sheol, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Do you understand what that means? That means Jesus expects us to storm the gates of hell. And now I want to share something with you rather briefly. And it kind of blows my mind and you may not believe it. And, and that's, that's okay. You don't need to believe me. I just hope you believe the, the word of God. But for about 17 years now, on various occasions, I have prayed for people oppressed with, with demons. And sometimes those demons have such a hold on a person or the oppression is so severe that the spirit will seize the person and begin speaking through the person. And then after the spirit is cast out, the person won't even know what's happened. Well, about 15 years ago now, my wife started praying with me. And I discovered that she had an amazing and yet kind of troubling gift. And, and, and that was that sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, God would allow her to see and hear what was going on in these other dimensions before they manifested in my dimensions, space and time as, as I know it, and so I learned to trust her gift. Now, if you can't believe that, hopefully you can believe this. My wife is the church cleaning lady, and you can verify that empirically by coming down here on Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever and just watching, watching her but this building, you see, has needed some rather extensive cleaning. So from time to time, Susan will come get me in my office, which is right up there, and she'll say, uh, Peter, come with me, please, um, we, we need to pray. For she will have heard a voice on the other side of some door, or seen the form of a child huddled underneath some old stairwell. 
Two years ago in September, I preached three sermons, you remember? Jesus in the land of ghosts, and, and I freaked people out. <laughs> I'm good at church decreasing or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway you, can, you can watch those if you want on the, on the church uh, website. Well, to make a very, 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 very long story very short, through some amazing occurrences, um, even including video footage, we discovered that some evil spirits have been assigned to this building and that this building was built upon an old Masonic graveyard. Well, after a bunch of prayer and the help from a bunch of people, I, I believe that those evil spirits have been bound and cast out, and yet Paul still says, we, well, we, we, do, we do battle with them. And yet, even though having been bound and cast out over the last uh, two years, and I think this is somehow related, we've encountered ghosts. I don't know how else to say it, but dead people. Now, demons will relax, react just, just violently to the name of Jesus. I've discovered that. It burns them like fire, the name of Jesus. But dead people, ghosts, react just like confused people. Because they are confused people, lost people. It's imperative that you never seek the dead for information. But what's a guy to do when they're bothering his wife, the church cleaning lady, right? So like I was saying, Susan will come get me, and, and I won't ask for information from them. I'll, I'll preach the gospel. I don't hear or see them, but others in our fellowship have, other, other people have, and their stories about this building. I could tell a multitude of stories now, but for now, just this. On one occasion, after hearing a voice from behind a door, and the voice said, leave me alone, after hearing a voice from behind a locked door that leads to this large empty space, uh, which is actually this room right under this stage, back under the, the organ. Susan and I had communion and then prayed over that room. In prayer, Susan saw figures like hiding, cowering in the dark, and so I prayed that Jesus would show himself to them, and he did. He did, but he was so brilliant, so bright, that Susan said they would like cover their eyes and just cower in fear. And so, I know this is weird, but I began to preach. I began to proclaim. I told them who Jesus was and that Jesus had died for the sins of the whole world and that Jesus loved them and that they could trust him. And then Jesus opened up this brilliant door in the side of the room, down below the stage. And some of the people, or whatever they were, some of the, them, the ghosts, they, they started coming to Jesus. And some walked through the door with Jesus, and yet some remained. And then Susan heard Jesus say this, I'm leaving the door open for those that will still come through. And then she heard a voice, and this is what the voice said. Children of the desolate, you are desolate no more. Reminds me of that crazy verse in Isaiah where Isaiah prophesied the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her that is married. Well, anyway, I believe that now this building has been cleansed and I believe that the dead have walked into life through a door under the stage. And I believe it is because they hear you singing. In other words, I believe that your faith, church, your faith, our faith, has announced God's victory to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And that Christ in you has set captives free. And I know that some will think I've just totally lost it. I mean, I know that. And I know that a whole lot of people don't know me, so I don't expect you to, to trust me. I know that that's freaky weird, so that's why I said, please don't feel like you need to believe me. However, I do hope that you would believe the Bible. Ephesians 3, 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, 
I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach, to proclaim to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in the King James Version, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Wow. Paul has already told us, 110, that, that, that God's plan is to anakephalio, unite all things in Christ, right? Breaking down the dividing wall of, of hostility. And now Ephesians 3, 9, announcing his manifold wisdom, his victory to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places through the church. Which is you. And you thought that through you, God just wanted to have a bake sale. <laughs> right? And deliver some pamphlets to the people across the street saying, come to the luau. Through you, he delivers a message to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And Paul's going to go on to say, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the world rulers of this present darkness. So do you get this? You need to get this. Flesh and blood is not your enemy. The people on the other side of the wall are not your enemies. Those people are your prize. It's the principalities and powers that convince you that those people are your enemies. So that instead of liberating the captives, you'll further enslave the captives and build walls for the principalities and powers. It's time we stop glorifying the principalities and powers and having more faith in the power of Satan than the power of Jesus Christ the Lord and the blood of his cross. So anyway, what are the principalities and powers in the heavenly places? It's a good question. And it's a fascinating topic that we'll have to talk about more when we get to Ephesians chapter six. But in case you're interested, in 1962, the theologian Henrik Burkhoff published what's perhaps uh, the, the, the most systematic, influential book on the topic. It's titled Christ and the Powers. It seems that rulers and authorities, by rulers and authorities, Paul meant rulers and authorities. He meant governments, but not simply human governments, not Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, but the spiritual forces behind governments, and not just political political governments, but like mental governments, systems of thought, structures of activity. He meant sociologies and psychologies and economies. Paul believed that at least uh, most, if not all, of those powers were created by God. Created by God uh, as good, but were now fallen and corrupted. And he believed that they are spiritual. In other words, that they are the gods of this age, the gods of our time. Sociologists like Emile Durkheim write about concepts like collective effervescence and this idea that a crowd can become more than the sum of its parts. Like the collective psychology has a reality or an existence all of its own. Well, Paul would call that reality a principality or, or a power. So when Demetrius the silversmith, for instance, in Ephesus, started a riot against Paul, it really wasn't just a dude named Demetrius, but a principality associated with the goddess Artemis, a fallen angel or demonic entity assigned to Ephesus to keep the Ephesians in bondage. Just as there were demonic entities assigned to souls somehow trapped in this building, in time, space, Entities related to Masonic oaths. Entities related to racism, like the KKK. Entities even related to human religion. In fact, those seem to be the most powerful. You know, when John the Apostle sees the beast from the land in the Revelation, you see, he's talking about a demonic entity attached to human religion 
in the land of Israel. The land. Uh, and it was like a principality or power. And when John talks about the beast from the sea, he's talking about the empirical power of Rome from over the sea. He's talking about principalities that act like beasts. They rule over men's hearts, in other words, through threats and through fear. And when John sees the great harlot in the Revelation, he's talking about corrupt economies, uh, selfish commerce, economies of consumption, a principality that rules men's hearts through seduction. You see, a harlot buys and sells people, buys and sells love for her own ends. She buys and sells people in the name of love, and, and it's not love. The principalities and powers rule men and women's hearts through fear and covetousness. In other words, they enslave humanity through fear of punishment and the promise of rewards, even if they do it in the name of love. Because, you know, if I, I love out of fear for myself, well, it's not really love. I'm merely using love to survive. Like a beast. Survival of the fittest, a beast. And if I love to obtain some reward, well, that's not love. I merely use love for my own ends like, like a harlot. So under the dominion of the powers, I compete with people like a beast, and I use people like a harlot. And I build dividing walls that encase my own soul in hell. The principalities and powers are under the dominion of the dragon, who is Satan, whom Jesus called the ruler of this world, but the ruler who is judged and cast out at the cross. The principalities and powers have not or cannot comprehend love. For the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended it understood it, overcome it. God is light, God is love, and love was revealed on the cross. The principalities and powers keep us in bondage by convincing us that God is not love. And grace is an illusion. And Jesus did not die for the sins of the whole world. That love, you see, is a lie, a weak lie, a mere idea, a, a, a logos, in other words, a word without substance, when in fact, love is God, and with his word, he creates all things and redeems all things. His word is Jesus. In Colossians, Paul writes this. God disarmed the rulers and authorities, the principalities and powers, made a public example of them, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it. And the it is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Hendrik Burkhoff writes, it is precisely in the crucifixion that the true nature of the powers has come to light. Previously, they were accepted as the most basic and ultimate realities. And that's the truth, right? I mean, that's the way people live. What else is there other than fear and covetousness? They were accepted as the most basic and ultimate realities, as the gods of the world. Never had it been perceived, nor could it have been perceived, that this belief was founded upon a deception. The principalities and powers, you see, are good ideas that have been twisted into lies, and the cross showed that the powers, in fact, do not work for God, but are in exact opposition to God. You know, it was the beast from the land. The religious leaders of Israel who came to the beast from the sea, the empirical powers of Rome, and inspired the harlot, that is the crowd, the democracy in Jerusalem to chant, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And yet there, on that cross, as he was crucified, he conquered them all. How cool is that? He conquered them all. In the Revelation, John describes it this way. In the midst of the throne, I saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain. 
And I erred every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, praising the Lamb and, and the, the, the Father and the Lamb and saying uh, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. The Lamb. So, so what, is that, what is that Lamb? <laughs> well, that Lamb is the Word of God. In Greek the logos of God. In other words, he is the idea of God. The idea is revealed in weakness, and yet nothing is as powerful as the idea of God, the word of God, the, uh, the choice of God, the judgment of God. It reminds me of this scene in a rather silly movie, but insightful movie called V for Vendetta. Have, have any of you seen V for Vendetta? Well, you know, the hero V is battling the corrupt principalities and power of this post-apocalyptic British totalitarian government. And at the end of the movie, they try to kill V, and he says this. Die! Die! Why won't you die? Why won't you die? Beneath this mask, there is more than flesh. Beneath this mask, there is an idea, Mr. Creedy. And ideas are bulletproof. An idea. And ideas are bulletproof. Well, on the cross, the body of the word of love was broken. And the idea of love spilled out. For on the cross, Jesus refused to be controlled by the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this present darkness. Even though we, the crowd, nailed him to the tree, uh, he died for each one of us, not for fear of what might happen if he didn't. Not for fear of hell. In fact, he descended into hell. And not for some sort of covetousness or lust of heaven. He already was heaven. In other words, he didn't love us for some other reward. We are his reward, his inheritance, his bride. You see, love is its own reward. But on the cross, I'm not even sure he saw that. For he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, love, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, you see, there was no miracle. And that was the greatest miracle. On the cross, there was no great demonstration of power. There was no power. And yet that was the supreme power. On the cross, love didn't work for Jesus. And yet, he loved love for no reason. He is the reason. I'm saying that Jesus chose love in absolute Freedom. And there's a word for that. And the word is faith. And God raised him from the dead. And the walls came tumbling down, the walls of the temple, old Jerusalem, the gates of hell. In space and time, they're still tumbling down. And, and they come tumbling down through us as we proclaim the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. And how do we proclaim the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers? How do we battle against the world rulers of this present darkness? Well, we'll talk about that a lot more when we get to chapter 6. But for now, the bottom line is this. We choose love. in weakness, and that's called faith. And you see, that, my friends, is a very strange weapon. Faith is far more powerful than any gun, and as weak as a naked man hanging on a cross. Let's finish. So that through the church, verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose, or literally the purpose of the ages, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is 
your glory. Paul is in prison suffering. You see, now there's no earthquake busting open the prison door. Now there's no miracle handkerchiefs getting passed around Rome, at least that we know of. Now Paul looks like a failure. It looks like his Christianity is not working. Rick Joyner wrote this amazing book about a vision that he had. It's titled The Call. At one point in the vision, he says he encountered the Apostle Paul, and Paul said this. On earth, you cannot measure eternal treasures. When I died, it looked like everything for which I had given my life to building on earth had already perished. The churches I had given my life to raising up were falling into apostasy. Even some of my closest friends were turning against me. During my last days, I felt like I had been a failure. I remember reading that and thinking, could that be true? And then I read 2 Timothy, which most scholars think is the last letter that Paul wrote before he was martyred. 2 Timothy 1.15, all who are in Asia turned away from me. All who are in Ephesus is in Asia. In that day, Asia Minor was like, was like Turkey. That was the province of, of Asia. Ephesus was in Asia. Paul didn't know about the letter that would be sent 20, 30 years after he had died from John the Apostle. All who are in Asia turned to... Uh, 2 Timothy 4.16, at my defense, no one came to stand by me. All deserted me. But the Lord stood by me. 2 Timothy 2.9, I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God, the logos of God, the idea of God is not bound. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? You, you know, Paul um, left Ephesus in Acts 20 right after the riot uh, over the worship of the goddess Artemis. So, so Paul's demonstrations of power didn't defeat all the, the powers. Yet when Paul was imprisoned in Rome awaiting execution, when Paul felt like maybe his Christianity wasn't working, when Paul felt like his ministry had been a failure, when there were no great and miraculous signs, when Paul felt like a failure but exercised just a little bit of faith in the midst of his sufferings and so wrote a few letters... Well, unbeknownst to Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote the Bible and changed the world. And through him, Christ defeated just immense principalities and powers and captured you here today, 2,000 years later. And that's the successful Christian life. And I'm not talking about changing the world. I'm talking about faith revealed in suffering. Faith in the midst of what the principalities and powers call failure. See, some of you think that you're a failure. So you've you've said stuff like this to me. Peter, you're you're a pastor, and well God can use me you, but but me I'm not talented. I'm handicapped, so I've been sick. So, you know, I just kind of sing my little worship songs and try to love the people on the bus. But when you say that, when you say, I'm, I'm a failure, God can't use me, he uses you. I'm, all I do is sing my little songs and love the people on the bus. I want to grab you and say, but don't you get it? That's it. That's it. You're exercising faith in the midst of suffering. You're loving the Lord your God and your neighbor on the bus. You may not witness signs and wonders and great miracles, but I'm telling you that you are proclaiming the manifold wisdom of God to principalities and powers in the heavenly places, and you have no idea what dead things may be bringing to life because of the sound of your worship, that God may be raising to life because of the sound of your worship and the, mit- and the witness that, that, that is your love. When someone loves in the midst of suffering, that tells you something. It's real. 
God is real. And God is love. So you are defeating the principalities and powers. And if, if you're wondering, well, what is it to be defeated by the principalities and powers? Well, just buy a bunch of Jesus stickers, slap them on everything, and act like everybody else. I mean, speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but just don't love. I mean, say, Lord, Lord, and cast out demons and do many mighty works in his name, but don't know him. Don't know love. I mean, serve him and love him for some other reason, like to save your own butt from hell or to acquire his stuff, you know, to get his stuff that you call the kingdom of heaven. I mean, get really, really religious, just like the Sadducees and the Pharisees get religious in order to become a Christian success. You know, do it to be admired by men, have a, have a, to have a nice family and to make a good salary. In other words, make sure your Christianity works for you. And then you'll be working for the principalities and powers. But on the other hand, if you really want to do some damage to the gates of hell, just exercise a little faith. Faith and love in the midst of suffering. Faith is the successful Christian life. And check this out. It's really not your faith, as if it was to your credit. It's actually not your life, your successful life. And you really didn't choose love. Love chose you. Love created you. And love chose you. And love redeems you. He may be redeeming you. He may be choosing you. He may be calling you right now, even as I speak. Faith. Faith is God's idea rising in your heart. It's the life of Christ rising in you. A more literal translation of verse 12 would be this. We have boldness and confidence of access, not through our, through our faith in him, but through the faith of him. It's his faith purchased for us at the cross. Paul already told us that the faith is not of ourselves. I think that's why Paul goes on to say that freaky word thing at the end of, of the text we just read. What I'm suffering for you is your glory. What a weird sentence. Uh, you know that Christ suffered for me and that Christ suffered for you, well that's our glory. You see, Paul actually believed that he was Christ's suffering body in this world. He said that you are Christ's body in this fallen world, Christ's body. And when you have faith in the midst of suffering, that is when you trust God's love and so love others, even if, especially if, it hurts. Well, the principalities and powers, Satan himself, well, you know what they see? They see Jesus on you. They see the glory of God on you. They see the fire of the kingdom in your eyes. Jesus in you is God's weapon for you. Jesus on you is the armor of God on you. And then the gates of hell come crumbling down. Old Jerusalem comes tumbling down and the new Jerusalem descends like a bride. Why does a good bride love her husband? Well, anyway, in V for Vendetta, V dies. But his idea that people should love each other in freedom, the idea, the logos, rises incarnate in the ethnos, the people. In fact, the night he dies, they all dress like him and march on the parliament building to watch the walls come tumbling down. And you know, Paul will tell us to put on Christ, for we, in fact, are hidden in Christ. And that's how the walls come tumbling down. That's how each of us then becomes who we truly and uniquely are. That's how we enter the kingdom of God, where every unique person is united in him and bound together in love. Stand up! Jesus
who's Edmund Dantes. And he was my father. And my mother. My brother. My friend. He was you. And me. He was all of us. That's an imperfect movie. But everything good in that movie is this. That on night Jesus was betrayed, the logos of God, the word of God that had become flesh, the firstborn of all creation, he, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given to you. Take it, eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, uh, this cup is the new covenant, the eternal covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And so he calls you to his table and invites you to take his body and take his blood Take the meaning, take the word. Take the word of God into your heart. Let the call, walls come uh, tumbling down and be his church, marching upon a fallen and painful world. Lord God, we glorify you. We, we honor you, Lord Jesus. We praise you because St. Paul says that the Father um, gave you dominion over all the principalities and powers. And, and we think that's a really good idea. <laughs> In other words, we want you to be king. We want you to be president. We want you to be the authority. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, it's Christmas time and we're saying that we're really glad the government is on your shoulders. And Lord Jesus, we confess that we have been principalities and powers ruling over our own lives, and that was a bad idea. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we call you Lord, we confess that you are the power, you are the king, and to you belongs all the glory. And then, uh, Lord God, the lie is exposed. The lie is exposed because the principles and powers told us if we do that, we'll be slaves, but it turns out that slaves of you are free. And so, Lord God, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Now listen, I talked about, every, about, about, about everything that freaks people out in the sermon today. Um, demons and all that kind of stuff and hell and all that kind of stuff. And if you have questions about theology, it's important that I, I probably need to do this more often. I need to remind you that on our website, there's a link that has a little button called theology. So if you have questions about some of this stuff, just go to it and read it. And it's all stuff out scriptural, I, I believe good stuff. So um, if you have questions about that, do that. I mean, I think also sometimes people struggle with this. And I know that I have uh, growing up a son of a pastor living in the church, and that is with kind of the wild exhibitions of power in the Bible and wondering if there's some kind of mystery, you know, some kind of mystery that's been hidden for ages. And somehow, like if I just got it right, I'd get the secret mojo and be able to see all these things, do all these things. But this is the amazing, wonderful truth. Having seen a whole bunch of these things, that the mystery is this. God loves the people on the other side of the wall. In other words, God is love. And Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And if you trust that, if you believe that, well then something will happen. You'll begin to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you begin to love your neighbor as yourself. And you see, that's pretty much it. It's everything. And so we'll talk about all the, you know, about demonic spirits, all that stuff as we go further into Ephesians. But I just want everybody to know, um, your faith is priceless. It's this treasure beyond your belief. 
And, and so when you think like you're a failure and you just can't get it right and everything, well, just exercise a little bit of that mustard seed of faith. And, and you know what? God in heaven is thrilled to death because you know what that faith is? That's the blood of his son given to you. That's Jesus rising in you, and you belong to him. So uh, believe the gospel and live the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey there. I hope the message that you just heard or viewed helped you to believe a little more that God is better than you thought, the love of Jesus is deeper than you know, and the Spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. If that's so, I'd love it if you would consider two things. Number one, ask yourself if there's someone that you know that might benefit from this message and then uh, forward this link on to them. There are several ways that you can do that by visiting our website at thesanctuarydowntown.org. Secondly, I'd love it if you'd uh, take just a moment and uh, ask the Lord if He'd like you to contribute to this endeavor financially. We really can't do this except for the fact that God inspires people like you um, to give. And uh, you can do that by uh, going to the website and clicking on uh, the donate button or uh, by simply mailing a check to the Sanctuary downtown at uh, 2215 West 30th Avenue, Denver, Colorado 80211. Uh, thanks for being a part of what we're doing, and God bless you.